So I'm delighted to be joined by Clint Watts from Microsoft at Cyber UK TV. Clint, welcome to Cyber UK. Thanks for having me. First time in Birmingham. Fantastic. Um, so this year is obviously a massive, a massive year in terms of democracy across the world. What's Microsoft's role that you're playing to protect democracy internationally? Yeah, my team is the Microsoft Threat Analysis Center. We work alongside other great teams at Microsoft. Mystic, uh, which does uh, Microsoft Threat Intelligence on Cyber, uh, AI for Good, uh, which does a lot of the analytics, and then Democracy Forward, which is doing all sorts of things to promote democracy. And so the four teams together work in a lot of different ways to try and protect democracies. Uh, some things we're doing are account guard. We try and make sure that people know that their vote counted and there's some sort of record for it and you know, auditing. We also just helped launch with all the other tech companies, the Tech Accord, uh, very focused on AI and deepfakes. So we want to make sure that AI is not used maliciously uh, in any of the elections that are happening around the world. And then my team specifically focuses on trying to ward off malign influence activity from Russia, Iran, and China in any election. That's anything from trying to tip the election to a certain uh, party or candidate, you know, through inauthentic means or interfering with the conduct of the election. So that's kind of how we work as an apparatus altogether, and uh, it's a super busy year for us. Really interesting. I guess in the UK, where the election is very pen and paper, very much a pen and paper exercise, it's obviously not the process of voting that is at risk of, of cyber influence, but the uh, the organisations that run the election, the political parties. What what should those those organisations be thinking about as we head into an election year? Yeah, authenticity is the key. Everyone wants to know that their vote was tallied and it was counted and that it was authentic, right? And the other part of that is then how does everything happen in between? That's how do we protect election workers that are out, you know, trying to do the right thing, protect democracy, all the way to how do we protect institutions against all sorts of uh, information or cyber attacks? Uh, do we see breaches that might lead to some sort of, you know, eroding of an institution in terms of faith and confidence in democratic institutions? The more we can inoculate against that through information or, or through cyber protections, the better I think, you know, both Microsoft and the rest of these democracies are going to be. And we're obviously looking forward to the Paris Olympics. And I know from the London Olympics experience that the Olympics is both a really exciting opportunity, but also a, a, a cybersecurity challenge. What's, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, what's been fascinating to watch is one actor more than any other uh, has been pursuing attacks against different democratic institutions and international organizations and contests, and that's Russia. When we look at Russia today, uh, their influence operations, uh, their cyber attacks outside of Ukraine and, and uh, that battlefield really are focusing on three events. The first one coming up is the Summer Games 2024 in Paris. Uh, they've taken an interest in that. Uh, they have pursued this against the International Olympic Committee and, and the government of France, which is hosting this year. That's the first one to watch is will they try and malign the institutions or make things very challenging? Or, you know, will they actually try and create some conspiracies around the safety of participants? So that's a big focus for us here uh, headed into the summer. And taking a step back more, more broadly, how do you see the threat landscape uh, developing and evolving in 2024? Yeah, it's fascinating to watch how these three countries, Russia, Iran, China, which, you know, my team does uh, semi-annual reports on, public reports, to try and really raise awareness around the cyber and you know malign influence activity that comes together. A few things that are, are fascinating to watch. Iran, when we've watched them, uh, particularly over the last six to seven months, very much uses influence or claims of uh, cyber attacks to influence people's conversations when in fact there haven't been that many uh, overt or, or sort of covert successful cyber operations. They are in some cases successful from the Iranian side. Um, but large part, it's just influence. It's scaring people. Uh, they don't have trust necessarily in their information integrity. Next would be Russia, which uh, they work hand-in-hand, uh, -hand, uh, cyber and influence operations. It's a hack. It's a leak. It's to drive perceptions. At the same time, there's a whole military element to this right now that we've seen in Ukraine. It's the first multi-year cyber war that we've seen where Russia continues to attack Ukrainian infrastructure, continues to uh, attack the supply chain, and now uh, seeks to try and influence the policy and support 
by attacking institutions throughout Europe and North America. And then looking at China, really their you know, capability. Uh, at Microsoft, we did a report called uh, Volt Typhoon, which is a group that was going beyond traditional cyber espionage, but also doing things like trying to get into infrastructure, what would be called uh, phase zero military operations. So it's a major change uh, from a cyber perspective for China. Add to that, they do have an influence capability. Overt, we've known about for a long time, but trying to develop covert social media accounts. They're spammy, they're not particularly successful, but just that they're taking that capability development, really a new sign, and if you look back over the last five to six years, all three of those trends changing dynamically, cyber and influence converging and diverging in different ways. It's really interesting. Um, we've been uh, prominent calling out some hacker leak activity in the UK as part of the NCSC's work, and it's just really interesting that the tradecraft linking the cyber hack with the um, with the influence operation. So that's fantastically interesting. Um, moving to AI, I'm just really interested in uh, what your thoughts are on how we've heard a lot about AI and how it can be. Um, it can be beneficial to our adversaries, but how can it benefit cyber defenders? Yeah, I think the key point is when you're looking at cybersecurity, whether it was 2010 or 2024, there's always been a massive gap between defenders and offenders. There's way more people conducting cyber attacks on, on much larger scale. There's less consequences for them in doing that, whereas cyber defenders have to defend every day and they can never get it wrong, right? You have to defend every single day, never make a mistake. To do that, what do you need to do? You got to close the gap between, you know, intrusion, everything from scanning to intrusion to a breach to recovery. And how do you do that best? Well, you have to have more manpower. That's the way we approached it before. You saw cybersecurity as an industry just explode with more and more analysts, folks like you and I, you know, came to work in cybersecurity. But how do we enable them to catch up? You got to fill that gap. And I think that's where artificial intelligence is really coming to fold. And Microsoft, we have. Uh, cybersecurity Copilot, which is a tool to help us use AI to gain that advantage. How do we detect quicker? How do we analyze and assess faster? How do we reduce the number of man hours that a cybersecurity defender uh, needs to put into each and indiv individual investigation so they can focus and triage on the most sophisticated attacks rather than a large swath of data? So looking at that over time, we think that just using AI will help us close that gap very quickly. And I think the other thing is it will really change the dynamics uh, between defenders and offenders to where maybe we can catch up with less manpower, but a more sophisticated set of manpower in cybersecurity. So you're an optimist in this space then? I am, especially with having worked in cybersecurity now for over a decade, uh, working in the private sector and in the public sector, just looking at the challenges that you have to meet. You have all the restrictions, all the, all the regulation, you know, everything that you got to meet, and you need to catch up with a wide range of actors. Ten years ago, we struggled with attribution. We're there now. Mystic, our cyber team, fantastic at doing attribution. Add to that the ability to detect quicker. Add to that the ability to triage data quicker. I think you're going to see a major change in terms of the perspective and, and the balance of those cybersecurity versus cyber attackers. It's your first time at Cyber UK in the UK. It How is. does it feel to be here? Great. It's my first time in Birmingham. I, I, I got to, to come from Heathrow here today. I didn't know there were so many canals. It's a very beautiful place. Second, it's amazing over the last probably 10 years of my career, but particularly the last two that I've been working at Microsoft, the engagement we've had here in the UK. Uh, we've been coming here. This is my second trip this year. Uh, my team uh, at Microsoft, most of them are based in New York. We are in the UK all the time. and just think that really shows for Cyber UK, you know, in 2024, what is it? It's public and private partnerships. It's bringing together people in industry, you know, across both Europe and North America. What an amazing event. I mean, we, we really don't have a parallel to this in the U.S. People don't come to the U.S., you know, to make that bridge uh, across the ocean. They come here to the U.K. to do it. Clint Watts, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you.